What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the second episode of the Geologic Mapping and Structural Geology uh, playlist. Today we'll be going over base maps and deformation. This episode might run a little bit long, so bear with me. Um, I will put down in the description, if you want to skip to the deform deformation part of this, uh, of this slideshow, I will put the timestamp in the description. So, all right, let's, first thing is base maps. So, map projections. Maps are mostly, most widely used, are the most widely used method of depicting portions of the surface of the earth. Cultural features, which include roads, buildings, towns, pipelines, property boundaries. Um, geolog geologist maps depict the shape of the surface of the earth or the distribution of rock units. The earth's surface is divided, subdivided by lines of latitude and longitude. Lines of longitude are imaginary lines located where planes that pass through poles of rotation of the earth's intersect the surface. So lines of longitude are these lines north and south the zero or prime meridian is this line right here uh, it passes over Gr Greenwich England their angular distance measured in degrees minutes seconds identifies other lines of longitude in the plane of the equator east or west from the prime meridian these lines converge toward the poles uh, and are the maximum distance apart at the equator. So the equator is right here. And as you can see, it kind of expands out and maximum distance. So the Earth's surface is subdivided by lines of latitude and longitude. Lines of latitude are lines formed by the intersection of the surface of the Earth with the planes that are parallel to the plane containing the equator. <laughs> it's kind of confusing how the book puts it, but... Uh, lines of uh, latitude are just these lines going from east to west. These do not intersect. Angular distance of the line distance from the equator is, is expressed as number of degrees north or south north or south of the equator. The east-west lines are parallel. Many different types of map projections. It depends on the size and the location of the area to be de depicted. Choose one that will minimize the distortion. So this is the first projection. It's called the Mercator projection. It's rectangular. As you can see, all these uh, lines of latitude and longitude create either long rectangles or perfect squares near the equator. Um, <clears throat> lines of line latitude and longitude are laid out in a grid pattern. Longitude lines are evenly spaced, as you can see all pretty much evenly spaced the what changes the latitude they're spaced further and further apart from the poles and you know the the maximum distance between lines of la latitude are up here and then once you get to the poles they're closer together and because of this distortion at the poles it's rarely used to show the polar regions it's useful for navigation because bearings or compass directions are straight lines on this projection and then we have the transverse mercator projector projection uh, the, the like the mercator but the orientation of the cylinder on which uh, that's supposed to be globe is projected is different as you can see the mercator the cylinder is basically parallel with the globe whereas the transverse mercator is transverse to the to the globe so one meridian line on the globe touches the surface of the cylinder, as you can see here. Along that line and up to 15 degrees on either side, the distortion is not excessive. Beyond that becomes a serious problem. It's used by the USGS on many quadrang quadrangle uh, maps covering areas that range from 7.5 minutes to 1 degree. Most maps published by, the government, by government tick marks that provide reference to a grid system is known as the universal transverse mercator system. This grid system covers portions of the glo <laughs> globe extending from 84 degrees north to 80 degrees south. This belt around the earth is divided into 60 north-south south zones, each of which is 6 degrees longitude wide. The zones are numbered west to east, 
The point of origin for each zone lies along the equator at the point of intersection of a line of longitude and the equator. Separate grid exists. Points are located in terms of their distance east or west and north or south of this point of origin for the zone. On USGS topographic maps, tick marks printed in blue are spaced at 1,000 or 10,000 meters meter intervals along the map margins. And you can see the difference in how they're projected. Um, you know, this looks normal and uh, distortion is going to be worse away from this red line and this transverse Mercator projection. And this is another way to visualize it. <clears throat> so the polyconic projection, most USGS base maps uh, used this projection before 1950. Taking strips from the globe and flattening them out produces this projection and stretching and it stretches the outer part of each strip until it, contin it forms a continuous surface. The scale along the latitude is constant, the scale along the longitude increases. The central part has little distortion. Consequently, when projection is centered on the central U.S., the maps of all parts of the country except Hawaii and Alaska are only slightly distorted. The Lambert conformal conic projection. Cartographers use this uh, projection for many quadrangle maps and for maps of areas that are elongated in, east, in the east to west uh, direction. Lines of latitude and longitude are projected onto a cone-shaped surface. Distances are true only along two parallels called standard parallels, where the surface of the cone intersects the surface of the globe. Distortion of the directions and shapes is minimal. The standard parallels in the U.S. are 33 north and 45 north. So topographic maps. The surface of the earth is represented on top topographic maps by contour lines. Lines that are map projections of lines connecting points of equal elevation on the ground. Imagine a lake shore, as you can see on the bottom left picture, where the water intersects a land surface. So right here. And that would represent a contour line. If you can visualize that to make a map easier to read contours are drawn at regular intervals the contour interval is the difference in elevation between adjacent contour contours it can vary between five to 100 feet sea level is obviously the zero contour contour interval is selected on the basis of difference between the highest and lowest elevations in the area it's called relief the scale of the map the amount of elevation data available Contours are commonly drawn at 5-foot intervals in areas where relief is not great and a 100-foot uh, contour interval in high mountains. So let's see. Contour interval for this one, that's what, 20? 20, 20 contour interval for this topo map right here. It's good to practice. Okay, so what's the contour interval for this one? So let's see. This is their 1300... One, two, three, four, five. Difference is 50, so that's about 10 contour, ten foot contour interval. Okay, the location. The topographic maps produced by government agencies are general, generally for a prominent locality, town, or landmark. Most recent maps cover 7.5 minutes long wide by uh, 7.5 minutes latitude longitude area. Location by means of uh, public land survey. Most of the land in the U.S. has been sub subdivided by government surveys. The first step was the selection of initial point chosen at the intersection of a particular uh, meridian and parallel. So that would be right here. <clears throat> Referred to as the principal meridian and the baseline. Uh, respectively. The PM, well, the, the pr prime meridian and the baseline were then subdivided into six mile intervals, establishing a grid of townships, each six miles on e a side. Each successive township north or south of the initial point was given a township number, and each successive township east or west of the initial point was given a number called the range number. And as you can see, you know, you have your township number and your range number, and all these uh, little squares. 
Townships are subdivided into 36 sections or blocks of land measuring one mile on each side, not mine. Man, I have a lot of typos, um, which is called a one square mile. So ground, ground distance and map distance. We commonly measure distances by pacing, tape measuring, or a calibrated wheel that records uh, distance. These are ground distances equal to the horizontal distance between points only if the ground is level. Rarely corresponds with map distance between the same points unless the ground is very flat. Uh, high terrain areas, it's gonna that's gonna uh, change. You know the the ground distance and map distance, the variations between the two. So the difference between the ground and map or horizontal distance increases with relief. Map scales scale of most quadrangle maps expressed both as a graphic bar and a scale fraction is given along the bottom margin of the map as you can see right here and you actually have three different ones for if you want to use kilometers meters miles or feet bar scales show the map distance that is equivalent to a certain number of miles kilometers feet measured horizontally across the ground scale fraction indicates the number of units of length measured horizontally across the ground that are equivalent to one such unit on a map so for example one to 100 is could be one meter equals 100 meters on this map um well actually this map is one to twenty four thousand so one meter equals twenty four thousand meters on this map or one inch equals twenty four thousand inches on this map <clears throat> let's look at the three topographic maps and determine contour intervals and let's list all the cultural features shown on each okay so Contour interval, here's 900. As you can see, it's a it's bolded. That makes it a uh, one of the major topographic uh, contours on the map. And then you have 1,000. So let's count the lines. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the difference of 100, so that's 20. The contour interval is 20. And in terms of cultural features, we have some roads. I am guessing this is a railway. A tr for a train um, you have rivers uh, there's a church right here a cemetery demarcated by a cross um, reservoir probably for water uh, some structures demarcated by the black squares this one's a big building right here um, yeah I mean that's all I see it looks like Okay, so here's another one. All right, so maybe I zoomed in a little too much on this one. All right, so we have 3,400. Looks like it's going to be, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 200 divided by 5. That's uh, 40. 40 foot contour interval. And then we have a campground, we have roads, we have a railway, it looks like, or maybe a major road. Um, let's see what else we got visitor center a benchmark elevation right here yeah we have structures again roads I an amphitheater I'm guessing is right here uh, some rivers it looks like this is a uh, a wetland or my well, doubt a swamp but it looks like a wetland right here called big meadows Okay. Ranger station. Uh, yeah, that looks good. Okay. Let's look at okay, let's look at this map too. Okay, so what's the contour interval? We have some steep um looks like a river valley. Steep right here on each side. Let's see. So the contour interval we have Okay, so this is the 900 right here. One, two, three, four, five. So it's going to be a difference of 100 divided by five lines. That's 20. So a 20 contour interval. And it's good to practice that type of stuff. Okay, so true and magnetic north declination. The side margins of government to topographic maps are oriented in the direction of true north south. 
Because maps are projections on which lines of long longitude converge, the distance across the top of the map in the northern hemisphere is somewhat less than the distance across the bottom of the same map. Both true north and magnetic north are indicated on uh, topographic maps, as you can see with this symbol symbols right here. So true north, the direction to the pole of the rotation of Earth from any given point does not change. So true north is geographic north. And magnetic north is the direction a compass points. It is not located near the geographic north pole. It Compasses do not always point directly toward the magnetic north. Direction of the magnetic field changes slowly. Direction of the magnetic north within a quadrangle is essentially constant, and rates of change of the magnetic field is uh, generally low. Angle between the direction of true north and the magnetic north, as shown by the compass, is called uh, declination, given as part of the margin information on topographic maps. So according to this map, Minnesota, I believe, is, uh, so Minnesota is somewhere right here. Sorry, I'm not an expert on uh, those states up there. <laughs> but, uh, so we have Minnesota, and we have uh, uh, Geographic North. Looks like right here, and then you have uh, Minnesota somewhere in here. And that would represent, so it's a negative declination. Where I live, declination is about seven, eight degrees on, uh, between, you know, geographic north and magnetic north. Somewhere right here, that's about nine degrees difference. Bearings and azimuths. A bearing in is the direction of a straight line between two points expressed as the number of degrees the line between two points lies east or west of a north-south line. The bearing may be expressed relative to either true north or mag north, and if declination is known, possible to convert between uh, both. And uh, azimuth is basically 0 or 360, 45, 90, 135, 180. And then uh, bearings is north 30 of uh, 30 degrees of east. That's going to be 30 degrees in azimuth. Uh, this would be north 45 east. Um, of course, that changes when you you know you start getting down here or over here. You know, and I'll explain that right now. Azimuth of a line is the compass direction of that line expressed in the degrees and measured clockwise. In some surveys, angle is measured from north. A line with the bearing north 30 east would have azimuth 30 degrees. Can also be measured from south. A line with the bearing uh, south 30 e uh, west, sorry, which would be about right here. Let's see. Yeah, about 210. So right here would have 210 on it. Azimuth. Preparing a topographic profile. A profile of topography is the outline of land as it would appear in a vertical slice along a particular line. A topographic pro profile along a specified line can be prepared with relative ease if the horizontal scale used for the profile is the same as the horizontal scale of the map from which the profile is being prepared, and if graph paper with line spacing suitable for scale available. Most realistic if vertical scale equals horizontal scale. Common to exaggerate vertical uh, scale, especially in areas of low relief, to make features stand out. And as you can see, this is the uh, map view, and then this is the to with the cross-section line, and then this is your topographic profile, and we will actually be going through an exercise. But it's good to master topographic profiles especially if you're a young student because if you master topographic profiles before even doing a, a geologic cross-section you know you're going to be ahead of uh, the other students in your class but I mean if you're taking the ASBOG exam it's still good to uh, practice these and uh, hopefully you mastered uh, cross-sections during your field camp so following this procedure when construction when constructing profiles Select the vertical scale to be used in mark scale divisions on a piece of graph paper. This example uses the same horizontal scale as that of the map. Uh, place, the, place the graph paper along the line of profile on the map, which is this, the line of profile. I called it a cross-section line, but 
the line of profile. Mark the point where each fifth contour or heavy contour, uh, I called it a major contour line, but the uh, mark each fifth contour crosses th that crosses the line of profile. Uh, determine the elevation of each of these contours and place a mark at the uh, at that elevation. Also mark all streams, cro stream crossings, and ridge tops at appropriate elevation. Make as many other contour crossings as you are needed to clearly define the elevation of land surface along the line of profile. You know, you would mark 160, 150, 140, 130, 120, 140, 140, 130, 120, 110, and that would give you, you know, your, your line, your profile, and... Uh, you don't want to create angular lines between these points. You want to draw it as smooth as possible because that would be the most accurate um, profile. And connect the points you have marked with a smooth line. Avoid straight line segments unless you have a reason to believe the ground has a uniform slope. Note, when selecting vertical scale, check the line of profile and observe the highest and lowest elevations, which the highest and lowest are 160 and 110 in this particular uh, profile. Um, scale markings on the graph paper can begin with the lowest elevation along the line and the vertical markings must be long enough to reach the highest elevation along the line. All right, so let me exit out of this real quick. So we're going to do a quick bearings exercise and this isn't in complete order. All right, so, so what we're doing is we're going to, what is the bearing in azimuth from points A, B, and C? Measure, basically measure the red lines that I've created. So a is about right here so it kind of looks like oh wow I made it hard to see okay so the bearing of this particular line would be north uh, 67 east north 67 east and in terms of uh, azimuth at 67 so let's try B B is about right there let's see south what is that? 10, 20, 30, 32. South, 32, west in uh, bearing. And in terms of azimuth, you have 200, what, 12? Something like that uh, for azimuth notation. Okay, and then... All right, so C... Let's see, this is going to be south, that's what, 12, south, 12, east, and then in terms of azimuth, and I personally prefer azimuth for this reason because it can get a little confusing, <clears throat> but it's important to understand and be able to convert between the two uh, notations. This is what, 158 degrees, something like that on uh, azimuth. But it, like I said, it's important to practice this and understand and uh, be able to convert if you're studying for the ASBOG. Or, I mean, if you're a student and getting into geology, you definitely want to understand how to, how to uh, <clears throat> definitely, uh, you know, convert between the two and be able to understand how to measure these lines. All right, so we're going to be working on an exercise right now, another one. So... It's a draw a topo profile exercise, and I'm going to try and do it the best I can. Uh, it's not going to be perfect because I'm doing it on PowerPoint, but uh, draw the topo profiles along the top and bottom edges of each of these cross sections. On which of three uh, profiles is the ground distance across map closest to the map distance? Redraw the topo profile along line A and B using two times exaggeration. And what are the advantages and disadvantages of using vertical exaggeration? So this is actually 180. Okay, so this one should be a little bit higher. Put it right there. Let's see, 160. So now we're going to try and draw this. And this is the fun part because I don't know if I can draw this. Okay, so that's our topo profile for CD. It's kind of a pain in the butt. Okay, they did A and B for us. E and F is going to be that's 200 right here and then we'll have a stream point and it'll probably be a little bit lower than 120 so let's draw this real quick and obviously it will look much better than that if i could actually freehand this let's zoom in well, i guess i can't 
That's stupid. Um, so yeah, this would look. This would actually have a little bit more of a valley. I can't draw a valley for some reason, but uh, this would have a little bit more of a valley, and then it would increase to about 140. So this would be a, this line would be a little bit lower to about right, right here. So that that's basically with the vertical scale exaggerated. This is what it looks like not exaggerated. This is what it looks like exaggerated. Um, as accurate as I can get it. But, uh, you know, it brings out the relief a lot more when you exaggerate the vertical scale. Typically in a geologic profile, you'll want to... Um, typically your professor will ask you to... Um, what's it called? To... There's a there's a way to calculate it. I'm not going to include it in this episode. We'll probably get into it later. But there's a way to get the perfect uh, vertical scale for your geologic cross section um, to where it, you're not exaggerating the relief. Because typically, you know, in, in places where you're exaggerating, you're doing a cross section. You know, you're going to have terrain. You typically want to not exaggerate your vertical, not even at a one to one. It's actually less, you know, it depends on the, the relief in your area. So anyways, uh, I tried to describe, uh, explain that as best as I could using technology. But, you know, I hope you guys understood. If there's issues, I'll redo this. Um, I highly recommend you buy this book and do, you know, the, the, this practice. And practice topographic profiles in general. Create your own by looking at topographic maps. All right. So now we're going into deformation. So de deformation is... Uh, okay. Deformed rocks and their structures or fabrics can be studied and mapped. Each structure reflects a change in shape and perhaps transport within a given reference frame. We imagine what a rock looked like before deformation and what it has gone through. So what is deformation? It refers to the distortion or strain in a rock. It's a change in form or shape. Rock masses can be translated or rotated as rigid units without any intern internal change in shape. So an example is a fault block can move during deformation without accumulating any internal distortion. This is known as rigid body deformation. Non-rigid deformation is strain or distortion which means an internal shape change. So this is translation. You just, it's keeping the same shape. It's just uh, moving to a different spot. This is rotation. Uh, this is uh, uh, deformation is the transformation from an initial to final geometry, geometry by means of rigid body translations and rotations, strain, distortion, and or volume change. It's useful to think of a rock in terms of a continuum of particles. Deformation relates to the positions of particles before and after deformation history and positions of points before and after deformation can be connected with vectors, displacement vectors. A field of these vectors, uh, displacement field. The vectors do not tell us how particles have moved. They link undeformed and deformed states. The particle path, path each particle takes is the green arrows, as you can see here. This is displacement fields. Um, deformation history or progressive deformation refers to progressive changes during deformation. So components of deformation translation. It moves every particle in the rock in the same direction and distance and its displacement field consists of parallel vectors of equal length. An example can be considerable where thrust naps, de detached slices of rocks have been transported long distances. And this, uh, this figure shows you know what a this is a nap um it's typical in compressional and reverse thrust and um yeah reverse thrust faults uh this nap could have been localized strain at the base and possibly small rigid rotation as it's being pushed you know it's rotating a little bit as it you know as it slides across the fault as it's being pushed um but this is a good example of translation because you know you have this big body of rock and it's slowly being moved over millions of years and and now it's over here and where is this 
Jotan Knapp and the Scandinavian Caledonians. <laughs> I don't know how to say that, but uh, yeah, it started off over here and it's been pushed. And now it's over here in this uh, looks like a mountain range. <clears throat> so smaller scale mineral grains, layers, fault blocks may be translated along slip planes or planar faults without internal changes in shape. As you can see, the domino fault model, and we'll I believe we'll go deeper into that. But it, it's a normal fault. Uh, it's uh, characteristic in a normal fault area. Uh, you only have translation or movement. You know. Um, you know, it starts like this, and then it moves like this, and rigid rotation. So it slightly rotates and translates down, and you can see that it, it does that at uh, every fault block. So rotation, rigid rotation involves uniform physical rotation of rock volume, such as a shear zone, relative to an external coordinate system. And yeah, as I said earlier, it just rotates, you know. It starts off like this, the light brown, and rotates. And um, you, you use basically x, y uh, axes to put, uh, so this one starts at negative 1 and 1. It comes to 0 and 1. So components of deformation strain uh, or distortion is non-rigid deformation, which means you have an internal structure change. Any change in shape with or without change in volume referred to as strain and implies that the particles in a rock have changed positions relative to each other. We typically use our knowledge of what such what what the rocks typically look like before uh, going under strain to measure the amount of strain. So an example is what you see on the left is an oo light. It's typically pr not perfectly spherical, but it's pretty much visualized spherical perfectly. So obviously, if these become elongated, you can measure the amount of strain that has a, that these OO lights have gone through. A volume change is an area change in two dimensions, shrinking or expanding. It's also referred to as dilation, is, and it's considered a special type of strain called volumetric strain. <clears throat> and this is another way to visualize translation. This is the original configuration. It's been moved to the right. Um, and then rotation, it's been gently, you know, rotated. And then dilation just basically means the shrinking and distortion. As you can see, it changes significantly in shape. It shears uh, from the original configuration. Uh, deformation, detached from history. A given strain may have accumulated in an infinite number of ways. Particle flow may move along a variety of paths from undeformed to deformed states confined by other uh, particles. And this is another way to visualize it. This is your basic, your starting point, cube of rock. When it undergoes compression, obviously you have it, uh, the height increase vertically, but the length decrease horizontally. And this uh, this cube tension pulls or elongates the uh, the cube of rock, so it increases horizontally or is elongated, and then vertically shortens. So homogeneous versus heterogeneous deformation. Homogeneous deformation of strain is equivalent where deformation applied to a rock volume is identical throughout the rock volume. Rigid rotation translation, so no internal uh, change in the in the uh, in the rock uh, originally straight parallel lines will be straight parallel after deformation identical shapes orientation before and after initial shape orientation will differ from the final if the two objects have identical shapes but different orientations before deformation then they will generally have different shapes after deformation even if the deformation is homogeneous a circle will convert to an ellipse during homogeneous deformation where ellip ellipticity the ratio between the long and short axes of the ellipse will depend on the type and intensity of deformation. And uh, heterogeneous deformation, the strain volume or area change is not constant throughout the rock volume like in homogeneous. A deformation that is homogeneous on one scale may be considered heterogeneous on a different scale. Increase in strain, an example is increase in strain typically seen from the margin toward a center of a shear zone. As you can see here, 
This is a shear zone. Uh, strain is homogeneous, uh, sorry, heterogeneous on this scale, but can be sub subdivided into thinner elements, zones, in which strain is homogeneous. So a certain particle may have just been, you know, rotated or translated. From here, you know, from how we're seeing it from this scale, uh, you know, it's it's definitely heterogeneous. It's a bunch of different, uh, well, it's a, it's a volume change. And undeformed, this is a good little figure that I like. Um, and we'll get into what simple and pure shear mean. But basically, you know, um, you have your undeformed, what it looked like before deformation and along this uh, shear zone right here. And then, you know, it becomes elongated, the shear zone, during pure shear. And these kind of change, uh, the fabrics change orientation as well as the uh, these fossils uh, brachiopods sorry brachiopods <laughs> they become kind of elongated they change uh, so you have a, a little bit of heterogeneous uh, deformation there and the same thing with simple shear uh, they change not necessarily their orientation but they definitely become elongated Okay, so one-dimensional strain. A single direction strain is about stretching or shortening of lines or approximate linear straight objects. Elongation, or E, and we won't go too much into this math because it's not important for the ASBOG, but uh, elongation of a line is defined by E equals length minus the original length divided by the original length, where LO and L are lengths of line before and after uh, deformation extension of a line is identical to the elongation and is used in an analysis of extensional basins where elongation of a horizontal line and extensional direction include indicates extension negative extension is contraction and that's related to compression and tension which is reserved for stress stretching of a line is designated by s equals one plus e where s is stretched uh, quadratic elongation is that symbol equals s squared or stretching squared natural strain is ln s or ln one plus e two-dimensional strain observations of strain in planes or sections uh, angular shear describes the change in the angle between two perpendicular lines in the deformed media and angular shear is this symbol right here i couldn't find it on powerpoint but yeah it's this symbol Shear strain can be found where the objects of unknown angular relations occur. Where a number of such objects occur within a homogeneous strained area, the strain ellipse can be found. The strain ellipse is an ellipse that describes the amount of elongation in any direction in a plane of homogeneous deformation represents the deformed shape of the imaginary circle on uh, the undeformed section and is described by the long and short axis or X and Y axis. So this is your original, um, your original uh, strain circle at this point, and then as you get into, uh, you know, elongation or actually this is dilation, right? No, this is expansion. Field one is going to be expanding on this uh, pure area change. It's expanding out. Um, if you have an elongation in the x direction then obviously it becomes this one in the background. This is your original circle, this is your deformed circle. And then an area decrease, it shortens uh, vertically and elongates horizontally. And then this one obviously uh, shortens horizontally, I mean vertically, and kind of increases uh, horizontally. And then field three, um, it looks like it decreases in both. Uh, horizontally and vertically. Three-dimensional strain, it allows stretching and contracting in uh, three dimensions. Uniform extension, the state of strain where stretching in X is, is compensated by equal shortening in the plane orthogonal or per perpendicular to X. Uniform flattening, the opposite with uh, shortening in the Z compensated by identical stretching in all directions. And then plane strain is stretch in one direction that is perfectly compensated by shortening in one particular per perpendicular direction 
The strain plane is two-dimensional, no stretching or shortening in the y-axis. The strain ellipsoid, which is what we just saw in the, uh, in the previous slide, is a finite sp spatial change in shape that is connected with deformation. And as you can see, sigma 1, sigma 3, sigma 2. Um, so the strain ellipsoid is the deformed shape of an imaginary sphere with unit radius that is deformed along, the, along with the rock volume under consideration. It has three mutually orthogonal planes of symmetry, the principal planes of strain, which intersect along three orthogonal axes, x, y, z. The volume change per volume change equals volumetric strain of an object. Coaxial, the volume and area changes do not involve any internal rotation. So meaning lines parallel to principal strain axes have deformed have the same orientations that they have they had in the undeformed state. Um, isotropic volume change is equal in equal shortening and extension in all directions. No change in shape, only size. So this is your isotropic right here. And isotropic. Uh, volume change involves change in the volume or area and change in shape because its effect on the rock is different in different directions. So compaction. So this is a, an, an isotropic. As you can see, there's basically just a compression that changes uh, the uh, the height of the square, the original square, uh, sorry, cube. Um, it changes the height of the uh, cube, uniaxial strain or compaction. Contraction and extension along one of the principal strain axes without any change in the length along the other two requires reorganization, adding or removal of the rock volume. If volume is lost, uniaxial uni contraction or volume shortening can happen through grain reorganization during compaction of porous sediments. Uh, uniaxial extension, expansion in one direction, may occur by formation of tensile fractures or veins or during metamorphic reactions. Pure shear and coaxial deformation. So pure shear is a de uh, perfect coaxial deformation. This means a marker that is parallel to one of the principal axes has not rotated away from its initial uh, position. So an example is uniaxial strain. Uh, considered a plane strain with no volume change. So this is pure shear, and as you can see, it changes. This is the original square and circle, strain ellipse, um, strain, strain circle, and then strain ellipse. It's been shortened vertically and elongated horizontally. Simple shear is a special type of constant volume plane strain deformation. No stretching or shortening of lines or movements of parts in the third direction. Non-coaxial deformation. The lines parallel to principal strain axes have rotated away from their initial position, as you can see. An internal rotation causes simple shear to be referred to as rotational deformation. Inter internal rotation depends on the amount of strain so thank you for watching. Uh, please hit the like, the share, the subscribe, the comment. Uh, give me feedback on what you think of the series so far. Uh, the next episode will be covering strain in the rocks, preparation of geologic maps, which should be fun.